This is the Stock Trade and Reality Podcast, Episode 120. I mean, it's one thing to believe that a scam is going to deliver on whatever promise it makes. In this case, it was that they were going to mine for diamonds. But it's quite another thing to believe, you know, for your penny stock gamble to lead you into hallucinations, frankly, about vast government schemes designed to separate you personally from money that they owe you for no conceivable reason. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host. He believes doing deadlifts and squats builds character. Play trader. And that's the absolute truth. There's nothing worse than a deadlift or a squat. And in the world of fitness, as I've learned, the more you hate something, that means the healthier it is for you. And deadlifts and squats, I do not look forward to them at all. They get my lungs burning, they get my whole body burning, you know, those good compound movements. But boy, oh boy, are they healthy for you, assuming you know, you're know you using good form and all that sort of stuff. And it just helps build character in terms of uh, mental fortitude. Uh, you know, Life is not always peaches and rainbows and sweet old little ladies on motorized carts. Sometimes there's gonna be rough spots and you gotta be able to deal with those rough spots. Now I realize that uh, mental uh, or physical pain can be a little bit different than other rough spots in life. But you get the idea that a general sense of how to deal with um, not pleasant experiences can translate to many different areas of life and a not pleasant experience is what I would consider a deadlift and squat. And actually I'm pretty proud of myself because this is a perfect segue. Another not so pleasant experience, if you allow it to be the case, can be the world of penny stocks. And I am extremely, extremely excited about this as uh, you know, I, we've tried to make it, well, it's actually already happened once. And with that, uh, there was some sort of hiccup in the recording. So we had this whole two-part thing recorded and then IT Nate, the show producer, uh, yeah, we have an issue and it's not gonna work. So I have uh, come back and redone the interview. Now, Chez is not with us on this. And the reason for that is it's not really an interview. It's more of kind of just like a story time. So this is definitely a different approach than what we've taken in the past because our guest has a whole ton of experience and has seen a lot. So it's really just me sitting back, listening, and you know, peppering questions every now and then. And there's really no point, uh, to be honest, there's really even not much of a point for me other than just to kind of throw out a few broad questions and then just to sit back and listen. So that's why it is just me on this one um, and we hear a, a great story. So even if you don't trade penny stocks, uh, it's absolutely crazy what uh, uh, our guest talks about. And our guest is, and I'm not trying to be over exaggerating, but it really is the case, Janice Shell. She's, uh, in my mind, a, a penny stock legend. If you have any experience at all on message boards, social media, you've probably seen the name Janice Shell. She is uh, at, the, at the top of the, uh, the, the, the mountain as far as I'm concerned, as far as research skills, research ability, her understanding of the penny stock market. Uh, as I already said, she's seen a whole lot of things and she just shares one story with us, You know, one of the bigger scams that's happened and it's, it's fascinating. But uh, like I said, if you've never heard of her and uh, you, know, you plan on doing penny stocks, then uh, especially if you're on the message boards, it's only a matter of time before you hear something about Janice Shell. And the one thing that her and I uh, definitely have in common is the conspiracy theories that uh, can surround us. For me, it's my video chart analysis. Some people out there, and I realize this is goofy sounding, but again, this is the world of penny stocks. Uh-oh, Clay did a penny stock. That means this, you know, all these short, you know, just all sorts of conspiracy theories. She has the same thing. Both of us have been, you know, accused of being paid bashers. You know, we were paid by who knows who to, to bash these companies to cause stocks to go down. And you know the, the conspiracies, conspiracy theories are abundant, especially with her, even more so than me. So she definitely takes the cake in that regard. Uh, but I highly, highly respect her. And uh, she is somebody out there, and we talk about this. She doesn't just throw around opinions like so many pumpers do. You know, They just make broad statements. Her statements are always backed up with actual links and sources and things that are, are, convert them from an opinion into a fact. And she, she you know, talks about that 
and it, it's a very great you know discussion point that we have. So uh, part one here is going to be, uh, which is what you're listening to right now, is gonna be more so just the story, and then in the next part we talk about a lot of different uh, topics such as penny stock shorting, uh, you know, tips and quick tips for, for beginning investors if you do wanna get involved in the penny stock market. Uh, but it is a two-part interview, and this will be part number one. So without further ado, let's uh, kinda have a little story and hear about a huge scam uh, that actually did happen, uh, which is very hard to believe when you hear about all the details. But let's uh, let's um, hop in, and I'm stumbling over my words because I'm thinking back to <laughs> to the scam and all the parts, and it's just all I can do is really shake my head, and it re- literally did cause me to stumble over my words. But let's hear from Janice. Janice, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here, Clyde. And I really appreciate your patience because, uh, you know, as I already alluded to in the, the introduction, we had a technical difficulty, got an entire two-parter recorded, and then Nate told me that, yeah, it, something happened, so Janice has agreed to come back and, and do it all over. So, Janice, I thank you for your patience in that regard. Well, I thank you because this incident forced me to upgrade my operating system, so... You know, I like that. I like you just looking at the glass as half full. You know, so, I mean, you listen to some people out there and they would make you to believe that Janice is like the cruelest person on the planet. But look at this perspective. She is totally looking at a pretty bad situation as the glass being half full instead of half, half empty. So I appreciate that, Janice. I'm glad we could get your software upgraded. You're welcome. I mean, I, I really, I owe you thanks because I have been putting this off way, way too long. And, and yes, not, it was a trauma. It was a trauma, but it was over. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm good. We're all we, we've we've all hugged and made up. Now we're ready to to talk penny stocks and just go down some fun rabbit holes. I, I'm extremely excited for it. But before we get into all that, Janice, where did the whole market start for you? You know, what kind of got you interested in the markets to begin with? And you know, just take us back to the beginning of your personal journey. Well, I had been, you know, more or less interested in the markets since I was a kid, really. And, but of course I hadn't traded anything. And in high school, I guess, in our economics class, they made us each choose a stock and follow the stock for three months of the semester or something and see who would make the most money. And you know, and we naturally, we followed this in the newspapers. There was no internet then. And so since my object was to win, I looked for, and I didn't really, you know, know anything about stocks. Um, I chose the most inexpensive listed stock. So there was, there was, even in my distant past, there was a hint of my future. And the most inexpensive stock on the market was a mining company, not surprisingly, whose name I don't recall at the moment, but it traded for, I think, between 164th and 364th regularly. And every once in a while it would, like, you know, go up to an eighth. But Obviously, I saw a potential there for maximum profit. And since, you know, there were no rules, you could trade as much as you wanted, and you were not, you know, obviously using a broker. So if you said you wanted to sell right now, you could sell, and then you could buy at a lower price. And, you know, there were no (laughs) supply-demand problems of any kind. And so I took this, uh, Burma Mining, that was the name. And I took this stock, and I would just regularly buy it at 164th and sell it at 364th every day. And so on paper, I made a lot of money. And I thought that was interesting. However, even at the time, I realized that in real life, this would not be possible. So I learned two things. One, that paper trading, you always win. And 
second that stocks like Burma Mines were not likely to do you any good in the long run, although I mean, I won the contest. But actually, there was a flutter in Burma Mines about a year or so late after that. But uh, since I didn't actually own the stock, that was not of any particular interest to me. So you you got, your your stock career got off with a with a victory. You you won your your class because you kind of figured out a little loophole in the system, if you will, and uh, you know turned that to your advantage. But from our, our previous interview, I know that your your first kind of encounter with uh, you know you know penny stocks and such was uh, with uh, Silicon Valley or uh, Silicon Investor, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So after, what what after Burma Mines, I forgot about all this for many years, and. Then I was trading, you know, like normal stocks in the 90s. And <clears throat> I lived in Italy at the time, and finally I got online in 1996. And so one of the first things I wanted to do was look up some of the stocks that I was actually interested in. And this was my first day online. And I immediately found Silicon Investor. And living in Italy, and none of my friends had the internet. I had never heard of discussion groups, much less you know, discussion sites. And so I thought, well, isn't this strange and interesting? And, and so I was ready to go. And I decided, well, I'll just read, you know, this stuff, I mean, it, it's fascinating, but naturally I would never, never participate in this kind of thing. Um, but then I thought, well, you know, it might be easier to register because that way I can, you know, have my favorites bookmarked. And, uh, and my resolve not to post lasted about 24 hours, and then I just couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> I love that about how you're the famous Janice Shell went into all of this, not ever planning to, to, to post. But what'd you say that lasts for an hour or about 24 hours? 24 hours. Okay, so a full day you you were able to, to refrain. But what were these things, what were you reading that was just kind of driving you to the point where you decided, you know what, I am going to post? It wasn't anything really crazy. It was just, isn't this interesting? And, and there were things I wanted to ask people and there were things that I, you know, kind of wanted to say myself. And that's how it all began. Do you remember the first, uh, quote unquote, penny stock story, if you will, that you read about uh, on the Silicon Investor that really just had your, your head scratching? I mean, what was some of these first, you know, quote-unquote, bits of research that you were stumbling upon? Well, the first penny stock, because initially I was, as I said, posting on normal exchange-listed stocks. And, well, most of them were normal. And then I, I made a group of friends there, and we would post back and forth, you know, the way people do. And um, one day, one of them found this stock called Cashco. And Cashco was a stock with an interesting product mix. It made Y2K software and kitty litter. And so we thought, well, wasn't this just hilarious? And decided to post there for a day or two. And maybe look some stuff up and, you know, see what was going on at this company. So we began poking around and it turned out that the woman who ran the show, Ronnie, I wish I could remember her last name. She works in investor relations now in Penny Stocks. Um, Ronnie had been involved in the notorious Dimples Diapers scandal in Vancouver back in the early 90s. And that was a very unsavory tale involving the Canadian mob and 
but quite a few ne'er-do-wells, including her boyfriend, who had spent several years in the slammer for solicitation to commit murder. And he was working as the guy's IR person at the time. So we thought this was, you know, simply fascinating and started posting about it, and things just went on from there. So just so I understand, and so uh, listeners understand, their IR person had a, a rap sheet of a, attempted murder attached to him. Is, is, did I understand that right? Oh, no, he had tried to fire a hitman. Oh, okay, okay, all right. And this whole, the CEO had a previous history with like the Russian mob and all that sort of stuff? Well, sort of, but she claimed naturally she had just simply no idea, of, you know, what was really going on now. I suspect she did have no idea what was really going on, but these were pretty well-known figures, so I would be surprised if she genuinely didn't understand so it, she was involved with some, some unfa- unsavory types. I like how you at least are giving them the benefit of the doubt, just because you, you don't know, so you don't know the facts, so it, it's not like you're just jumping at conclusions on things, but I fully agree just listening to that, even though it's the second time I heard that, it's it is it really is fascinating like is this are you making this stuff up because this sounds like a a hollywood thriller here so that was your first introduction and i mean from there it, was it just a matter of finding new companies to, to dig into or did you kind of i guess where did things go from that point in regards to how you were uh, approaching all this was just was this just simple entertainment or were you being paid by these companies to bash uh, what what exactly you know led you to continue on through it? Just pure entertainment? Oh, it was just pure entertainment. And because after all, you know, if you start with this, I mean, actually, Crashco was not the first penny stock that I had become aware of because I'd actually put money in a penny stock before that, and that was around nineteen ninety six also. And I still had a full-service broker then, and I was still also getting quotes from the newspaper. I mean, you know, online services weren't by any means what they, you know, back then they were not at all what they are now. And even getting quotes could be kind of difficult. And also in Italy, you paid for internet use by the minute. I mean, it was your phone bill that you you paid, well, it was enormously expensive. So you were pretty much forced to limit the amount of time you spent online at first, and then things changed. But I noticed this stock called T-Fry, which for some reason it was a penny, but I think it, I don't think it was exchange listed then. It was an SEC reporter. And it could have been on the Amex, maybe. I don't know. And T Fry was moving so fast. It went from like, you know, 12 cents and every day it was up another five cents. And I watched it and watched it. And finally I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I bought some at the historical high. And the next day it came off badly, and a week later it announced a reverse split. And that was my initial penny experience. It wasn't a lot of money, and it wasn't a big deal. I, at that time, I just said, well, I'm not going to do this again. But looking back, T-Fry was a funny company. And the SEC finally revoked registration around... I don't know, it must have been 2006, 2007. It took them that long. But that was another product. That was another penny stock with a product. And people all said, oh, they have a product. Now, this wasn't a product you could buy in stores, but what they did was make machines that would make hot, piping hot, fresh, tasty French fries. You know, you'd put in your money and then you'd open a little door and the French fries would come out after five minutes because they fried them in the machine. And because they they had a product, and I want to talk about this, that that's what kind of got everybody in a frenzy. But 
No, I mean, I guess let's that that's a good first talking point is Janice, do products matter in the world of penny stocks? I mean, people throw it around all the time as, oh, this company has a product. And then of course, as you know, they'll, they'll go to like the store and, and post pictures of it. But does a product really mean anything at the end of the day? At the end of the day, it only means something if it's bringing in large revenues. Uh, it doesn't mean, because people will say, oh, you know, this is one of the, few penny stocks that actually has a product you can go to the store and buy it well that alone doesn't mean anything because we all saw the example of sponge tech which had a product you could go to walmart you could buy sponge tech sponges but it was also a scam and i know if i were running a scam i would want to be sure to have a product yes it's a little extra trouble but you will have true believers. I actually never thought about that, Janice. That's absolutely true. If I were running a scam, one of the first things is, well, let's get ourselves a product so that, in your words, we can get the quote-unquote true believers because that does make a huge difference. Oh, yes. I, it's very helpful to have true believers. Now, in the end, as with Sponge Tech and as with CMKX, the true believers can become very annoying. But... At the beginning, they'll spread the word, they'll be loyal, they'll actually buy your products, although that doesn't matter to you. Um, you know, they'll, as you say, take photos, they'll go to the store, they'll provide a list of local stores where they found your product. And there have even been cases where it looks as if people from, there, there have been companies that claim they have product in sale. And there have been suspicions that People probably from the company have gone out and put them on shelves themselves and quickly taken photographs. But, but yes, it will absolutely help you to have a product and it will make your product, your stock seem more credible, not only to investors, but also, you know, should the regulators give it a once over. However, it will so not stop them if they have reason to think you're a scam anyway. Now, you mentioned CKMX that also has a product. So this is, no, I know you talked about this last time, and this was... No, they had no product. Oh, they didn't have a product, but they have a fascinating story. That's for sure, because I remember you telling it last time. So, uh, now I don't remember, is this one of your, your, your top memorable stories, or uh, do you have other ones that are up that rank up with it? But uh, where does this one stand? And if you don't mind, again, could you walk us through that whole, you know, I, I want to call it a movie, because that's what it sounds like, but the whole, you know, background and story that, that accompanied that penny stock? Oh, CMKX was the biggest scam of the first decade of the century. There is no question about it. It issued more stock than any other comparable penny stock, I would say. It had <clears throat> its AS was... 800 billion shares. At its peak, it had an OS of 778 billion shares, I think. Now, 75 billion were canceled, and a few others were canceled here and there, and at the end of the day, and currently, the OS is, I believe, 703 billion shares. So that was kind of a bell ringer in itself. Uh, and I love how, you know, they canceled 75 billion here or there. So I, I, I can just imagine what the pumpers did with that. Oh, see, look, they're canceling 75 billion. Well, that sounds like a drop in the bucket when the, when the you know, the, the OS is in the hundreds and hundreds of billions. So just one of those little small things where it's just, I can only imagine what the pumpers did with that little bit of information when that was happening. Oh, that was seen as quite encouraging. Although things at that point had were already pretty, pretty grim. And the 75 billion shares had been given to an insider who was one of the few insiders to have the sense to see trouble on the horizon. And he just gave all the stock back and got out. 
So it was kind. It wasn't seen as the kind of benefit it would have been seen as if it had happened eight months earlier. Let's say. But can you just? Yeah, I, I, can you just walk us through the whole thing? Because it is just an app. I mean, you can start wherever you think makes the most sense, but th this is, I, 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 you are not exaggerating at all when you uh, you know, make the claim about it's the biggest scam and it's got some crazy drama with it too, with that lawyer and everything. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here though. Well, what happened was that in the CMK scan, a scam itself came to people's attention if they were paying attention in late 2002. When the people, because at that time, the PCBM scam, which was Pinnacle Business Management, that had begun back in 1998, 99. And the people behind that were Jeffrey Torino a uh, businessman from Florida, and John Edwards, an Englishman. Now, nobody knew about Edwards at the time. Nobody knew about Edwards until much, much later when CMKX blew up. <clears throat> he had been extremely good at keeping himself in the background. So PCBM began in around 19... 98. By 1999, it was drawing a good deal of attention, and I became interested and followed it. Now, it was a big deluder, too. It issued up to 25 to 30 billion shares. It never scaled the peaks that CMKX did. But... PCBM eventually tailed off. Nothing happened in the way of enforcement. There were those of us who had reported it to the SEC, but nothing happened. And they had enlisted the help of Vince LoCastro, a guy in Western Pennsylvania who had a couple of, of he sold cars and had a couple of distributorships and things there. And he also worked in Florida. He sold exotic cars in Florida, but that was a few years later. I think. And they, he was peripherally brought into CMKX. He was of the, the people who were you know, big in these scams. He was the only one who was never sued by the SEC or indicted, which is kind of odd. Now, he eventually was convicted of a felony because he had unpleasant mob ties in Western Pennsylvania and because he, well, he was never, they never got him on the strange fires at his stores. But that's another story. He has survived better than most of them. However, the leaders of this deal decided they needed to move on to a new scam, and so they created CMKX. And CMKX was presented as a mining company. They were supposedly mining diamonds in the Saskatchewan. And as the tale progressed, there were, you know, accounts of million a million acres in mining claims this that and the other hand now coincidentally sure uh i forget whether it's shore mining sure something but they were also mining diamonds in saskatchewan and they actually had found a few that were you know like gem quality decent diamonds and they had high hopes it it never worked out, but they had high hopes. And I bet that's the story of mining. Shore was a legitimate company. Um, however, this just added fuel to the fire as far as CMKX was concerned because the stock was way cheaper and it traded on a U.S. Or, you know, in the U.S. Shore was only Canadian. And... And so it all began. And in 2003, it was fairly quiet. And then 
it because some PCB hammers got in and the pump gradually started. It was not until 2004 that it went crazy. And that happened because the CEO, Urban Kazavant, had a brilliant idea. Now, Kazavant was not a brilliant person. This was kind of an accident. He was in his way crafty, but far from brilliant. And he was a fan of NASCAR. And so he decided it had always been his, he loved to go to NASCAR races and he loved to, he liked the whole spectacle. So he decided CMKX would sponsor some NASCAR stuff. And he did that. And he, so he went to all the races with some attendants and they had a, an RV and they handed out hot dogs and beer and encouraged people to buy stock in CMKX. And that was as good as having a product because people could look at, you know, at the funny car and say, that's CMKX's car. So it was something tangible. Yes, that was real. They could see it. They could even buy little toys, little toy cars. You can find them on eBay today. So this also attracted a lot of people who knew absolutely nothing about stocks. These were people who were you know, just NASCAR fans, and they went to the races. And much, much later, the IR guy said, you would not have believed how many calls I got the day after a race. So, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people were buying after every race. Word spread among stock people. The CMK export on iHub was incredibly active. Um, and in the end, they ended up with, and this isn't even counting, people who sold before revocation of registration, they ended up still with something like 40,000 unique accounts. Which is crazy. On, on average, I mean, what do you think a normal, uh, for, for context here, for somebody that's maybe not familiar, what do you think is a, an average, you know, shareholder base, you know, when for for, you know, a normal company, I, penny stock company, well, that is. you know, I think that it is more people than, than we might expect. But I'd say normal maybe between 500 and 1,500. And you said CKMX was how many? 40,000. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, so you know, keep on going. But I want to just keep things in context so listeners can just hear how crazy this actually is becoming. Well, what happened was that at least these people at that time believed they were getting themselves involved with a mining company. And that the mining company's objective was to stake claims, to do exploration, and eventually to do mining, and then everybody would be filthy rich. But as obstacles were encountered, because it was clear that Casavant was issuing stock you know, up the wazoo by the summer of 2004. And, and he was, he was, you know, in a period of three or four months, he issued over 400 billion shares. He'd already issued a lot. And he... No, you said it was clear. Just what made it so clear so people that are newer can kind of understand some of these red flags? Oh, all it was, you know, the volume was incredible. Volume was sometimes over, I think the highest volume they ever had was, well, it was, you know, because the SEC document said that it was, you know, all oh, they had volume in excess of 2 billion or around 2 billion shares a day. But that wasn't true. The volume was actually much higher because the way 
I think the highest ever was something like 42 billion shares in a single session. That's crazy. Was the transfer agent gagged at this point, or were they still giving out share structure information? Oh, the, tra the TA was always gagged. So would you agree that's always a big old red flag right from the get-go for somebody that's new in penny stocks is what's the status of the transfer oh, agent? Absolutely. And what happened with that, what was strange was that there, was, there were those of us who were insisting in early summer, way too much stock is being issued here. This is, you know, it's diluting like crazy. And of course, as you could easily guess, the response was that it's being shorted. Um... It wasn't being shorted. It was just Irby selling tons of stock. And what, what he was doing was he was issuing the stock to Edwards. And Edwards was depositing it. In a, in, I mean, obviously, the transfer agent was cooperating with all this. And Edwards did have opinion letters freeing the stock up. And they were written by a real attorney who wrote something like, 452 of them and the transfer agent accepted them and issued the stock and then they this continued into September I think and at that time it had become very noticeable, but meanwhile, in July, I believe it was, Kasavan suddenly announced that he was going to change transfer agents. And it was unclear why that was happening, but he announced the new transfer agent. I forget which one it was. And so immediately people called the new transfer agent asking, what is the share structure? And the new transfer agent said, well, it's like 426 billion shares. Which is not exactly what anybody was expecting. And that was a huge, huge shock to investors because they thought it was, you know, like, maybe 20 billion at the most. And all those naked shorts, they probably thought too, it had all those shares, you know? Some of them did. I mean, it was, ex attempts were made to explain that that is not how it works, but they, you know, they, they did say, oh, you know, they're created by, and still, you know, we trying to explain, no, this stock was issued by the company. There are still people who claim that Somehow that stock wasn't issued by the company. Well, it was. And so then Kasavant was furious, and so he fired the new transfer agent, briefly toyed with the idea of going self-transfer, which would have been total disaster, and went back to the old transfer agent, who was then once again gagged. But... Things went on with more and more stock being issued. And I believed at the time, and I, it's, it's hard to work it out, but they were giving these stock dividends in subsidiaries. Because, of course, they collected a bunch of subsidiaries and kind of related companies. You know how they do. And there was going to be one dividend at the, the very last dividend, because a bunch of worthless dividends were handed out. <coughs> there was going to be one that would have required raising the authorized again. And that didn't happen, but I was willing to swear they were going to raise the authorized to $1.5 trillion. And at about that time, the SEC had had enough and suspended their sister company. This was in October of 2004. And the suspension came on a Thursday, the day before everyone from that company, which was USCA at the time, 
and CMKX were meeting in Los, An Las Vegas for a big shareholder party. Uh, needless to say that the suspension cast a pall. Kazavan arrived with bodyguards. A good time. Do you think the SEC did that on purpose, or is that just a coincidence? Um, well, at the time, it was believed he was genuinely nervous and concerned for his well-being. I Obviously, he knew some of his shareholders were not all there, and, you know, anything could have happened. And... Um, I mean, do you, do you think that the timing of the, the SEC suspension of the sister company right before this big shareholder party, do you think that was on purpose by the SEC or was that just a coincidence? They certainly knew about it. And, I mean, you know, a lot of, there'd been a lot of publicity about the party. So I don't know whether they really did it on purpose. If they did, it would have been reasonable of them, I think, because part of the idea of the party was to show the world how much people love their CMKX and encourage them to buy more. So everybody got there and it was kind of, you know, it was sort of sad, but people tried to have fun. And that is where we learned that if you're having a shareholder party, you have to have bacon wrapped shrimp. They oohed and odd over the bacon wrapped shrimp. So, any stuck people out there, it's an essential. It's an essential. <laughs> you're, you're, this is, you're being honest, bank, bacon wrap shrimp was the big highlight of this yes. party? Yeah, that just, yes. perception, uh, just another one of those tangible things, huh? Uh-huh. I mean, ooh, you know, and when they finished one platter of bacon wrap shrimp, another magically appeared. It was just wonderful. On the not so wonderful side, there was the Canadian woman who became extremely tipsy and charged the stage while Casavant was speaking and denounced him as a fraud. And someone captured that on video. That was just hilarious. And I mean, I really wish I'd been there. Many people afterwards really, really wished they'd been there. That sounds like straight off the show, Jerry Springer. It was very much like that. And, and the CMKX lawyer, who was lawyer also for USCA, the one that had been suspended, had, well, he was meant to be there to talk to people and lend more credibility because he came from a big New York City firm. And he spent the weekend in his hotel room. Um, and after that, the investigations began. Everybody was being investigated. And the following February, the SEC suspended CMKX and also moved to revoke registration. And interestingly, CMKX fought the revocation, which very, very few companies do. And that was a fascinating opportunity because there were still loyal shareholders who were convinced that the stock was being shorted up the wazoo, who were convinced that Casavant was uh, completely honest, and they decided to show their support by attending the hearing. And the SEC decided to show its seriousness by making a lot of their exhibits available for purchase. And one of those exhibits was the TA logs. And one shareholder who had been a one of the staunchest logs was appalled when he got to the, the revocation hearing. He just could not believe how bad things were. And, <clears throat> and he bought the TA logs and all the other exhibits. And that changed the minds of a great many people. But not enough, because the ones who were left became ever more, well, they were crusaders. By then. I mean, what was the rationale? I mean, to, to look at TA, the transfer agent logs, 
how, how did they rationalize that? What, were they still blaming the shorts or what? They, I mean, first of all, they just refused to understand some things. They refused to understand that only a company can issue stock. I mean, they'd say crazy stuff like, oh, you know, that, all that stock was issued by, by Shorty. Well, a Shorty doesn't issue stock. Shorty can't issue stock. Only the company can issue stock. So if, if there's too much actual issued and outstanding stock out there, it's because the company did it. There is no shadow of a doubt anywhere. That is how it works. And there are people who just don't don't want to accept that fact for whatever reason. And but a lot of these people just kind of ignored everything because at that by that time they had sort of gone off the rails. As I said, originally they believed, you know, most shareholders believed they were investing in a mining company. But it all turned into this enormous big thing about shorty, first of all. So by the time, once they were in post-revocation hearing period, and then they were going to appeal the revocation of registration, and then they suddenly dropped that. And by this time, many of the remaining longs had turned into conspiracy freaks. And they say, oh, well, you know, that's because there's a plan. There's a secret plan. That's why they dropped it. Well, they dropped it because they realized they couldn't win. And, you know, that there was just no chance at all. And so finally, in September or October 2005, registration was revoked. Now, normally that would be the end. But it was not they had hired a new lawyer, and he had brought in Robert Mayhew, who had once been Howard Hughes's gopher, basically. And Mayhew was a jolly old guy. He was 87 or something at the time, and he needed to make some extra money, and so he and the attorney, Donald Stockwell, would perform various services for penny stock. But Mayhew, you know, his role was to lend a name. It was not to really to do anything. He was very kindly. And several people spoke to him and he felt sorry for shareholders who had been screwed and so on. But he had no idea what was going on with the company. He was at the hearing, in fact. He gave testimony. And he was asked how many employees the company had. He had no idea. He had no idea about anything. And however, these, you know, the crusaders among the group said, oh, that was part of the plan for him to pretend he didn't know anything. And it got crazier from there on out. They, you know, the conspiracy theories became increasingly more bizarre. It all had to do with Shorty, but it also had to do with the government because there had been some kind of secret sting and the government had collected unimaginable sums of money which were due to the, the, the Xers, as they were by then called. And eventually this lunatic lawyer, Al Hodges, got involved. And he, representing five shareholders, he sued the SEC commissioners personally for $3.87 trillion. You said trillion. I said trillion. <laughs> Alrighty, okay. You know, and it just, I mean, Crazy Al is called Crazy Al for a reason, obviously. He's quite elderly himself. He's in his 80s now. Um... And he is totally nuts. He then got himself hooked up with this English conspiracy freak called Christopher something, Christopher Story. Or maybe that was it. He died. Obviously, he was murdered, you know. And Christopher Story had these, I mean, you know, just, just totally freaky ideas. 
they had in part to do with the Nasara conspiracy theories. In part, they were his own invention. But, I mean, he had Crazy Al sending letter faxes to the Queen of England and somehow or other to the people who were clinging on to hope with CMKX, all this was in some way plausible. In what way, I do not know. Um, and then there was another guy involved who was a descendant of Wild Bill Hickok. Um, I mean, you know, it just doesn't get any more bizarre than this. And of course... Yeah, so how how does really all this end? Because I feel like this just, just could keep going on and on. I mean, at the end of the day, CKMX was and has proven to be a total scam, yes, right? Yes. Meanwhile, the SEC lawsuit was, you know, civil suit was proceeding. The DOJ's criminal case was moving very slowly because the perps had fled. Most of them. I mean, Casavant went back to Canada. Uh, Edwards went off. Well, he stayed in the States for a little while, but he went, he was British, so he went back to the UK. Um, one of them went off to Russia, Torino. Well, he was arrested in Amsterdam eventually. So this created extradition problems everywhere. And extradition is not as simple as you might think. And this stuff took years. Um, John Edwards was arrested in 2000. He was arrested and jailed in London in 2009. He was extradited back into in the States in 2015. He is still in jail in Las Vegas. He's now apparently trying to cut a plea bargain after all this time. Uh, he had tried to just to get out by claiming he suffered from dementia, but so far this hasn't worked for him. And, but there are still believers. There are, they believe. They believe they were cheated. Um, they, Till this day you're saying there are believers? Yeah, still. Not a whole lot, I don't think, but into the hundreds at least. And they are that I mean, I I realize there was forty thousand you know individual accounts, but still in the hundreds. That's to this day that that just seems so crazy. It's it just crazy. the human mind is a fascinating place. It is crazy because they. I mean, it's one thing to believe that a scam is going to deliver on whatever promise it makes. In this case, it was that they were going to mine for diamonds, but it's quite another thing to believe. You know, for your penny stock gamble to lead you into hallucinations, frankly, about vast government schemes designed to separate you personally from money that they owe you for no conceivable reason. It, yeah, it, yeah. I, I really don't know what to say because it is. You're right. It's crazy how something like you said. Just hey, you're, you're taking a gamble on a penny stock. Why? Why has it led to hallucinations? I mean, that's the perfect word. It, it's 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 mind boggling it, well, how how all that can unfold is due to the internet. I think a lot of these people would have just walked Good point. away if they didn't have support from their friends in the group. And for many years, these people had a room in Paltalk where they would gather nightly, pretty much. They didn't have just one room, they had several rooms. And they would gather and they would basically encourage each other to believe in ever more crazy stuff. And their posts were just hilarious. I mean, these were, for the most part, not on iHub. Um, probably some were copied. Mo much of the posting went on at Raging Bull until Raging Bull just became impossible to use anymore. And <clears throat> but there was this one woman who 
I mean, there were people who were actually, and I know someone personally, I mean, personally in the sense of knowing them on I have, who said her brother-in-law and his wife were out looking at million-dollar houses. You know, oh, should we really spend eight million on our new home? You know, they had hired a real estate agent to take them to view these places, and they were not alone. Many others were doing that, and there was this woman who she was online a lot. And one night around two a.m., and they there was this whole thing. They were going to get packets when their money came in. They always called them packets. And there was this complex system that people with over X number of shares would get black American express cards and people with a lesser amount of shares would get green America. I mean, you know, and it was all incredibly detailed. This is another thing you do if you're running a scam. You make it detailed because people find detail convincing. And this woman was typing away one night at 2 a.m. and her dog started barking. And she said, oh, oh, I have to go see what my dogs are barking about. Maybe it's the FedEx man. The FedEx man? Yeah, at 2 a.m., bringing her packet. Yeah, that's the... the yeah. Maybe, I, I guess I can't sit here and proclaim to know everything about FedEx or UPS, but... From what I'm aware, they do not deliver packages at 2 a.m. Uh, I do not believe they do. I think that it's kind of policy. And But this was this woman's conclusion. Yes. And she was deeply disappointed when it was not the FedEx man. Now, mind you, this woman in real life worked for a psychiatric institute. I, yeah, I don't even know what to say anymore at this point. This is just, I, it, it really feels like you're, I, I mean, I know you're not making all this stuff up, but it really feels like it, this stuff is just made up because it's so just not even in the ballpark. It's like not even in the parking lot. It's like in the next county yeah. over. And this is why a book, I mean, a guy did write a book about CMKX and it's not a very good book, but he didn't include this kind of stuff. He included some wild stuff. But if he told the whole story and went into detail about these people, nobody would believe it. I mean, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't watched it happen. And is the board still available on Investor Sub? I, I would oh, think yeah, it is, sure. right? So I guess if you don't believe uh, Janice and I and don't think this all really happened, that's one of the kind of neat little features about Investors Hub is the, the, the message boards stay around and you can literally go back to post number one because it's all documented and you can start at post number one and read through everything and I'm assuming there's, uh, who knows, maybe even millions of posts, I guess, I guess thinking about how big this one was. But uh, yeah, you can go back and read through the eyes and you know, You'll probably even did you post on the the investors have board? Oh yeah, Janice? I was the moderator from two thousand four on. Okay, well, so I mean, you can. I guess if you don't believe us, we'll just leave it at that. You can go back and read it through investors hub, but that is crazy stuff. But I want to kind of switch yeah, over because this was one of never my never made a million posts. I don't think any I have board ever had as it. It's okay. Uh, but hundreds of thousands, probably three hundred forty-eight thousand posts right now. right now and that that is a whole lot of posts and we're going to end it right there as i said at the introduction this is a part one of a two-part series so if you want to come back then come back for episode 121 but as far as episode 120 is concerned we are done before i part ways though want to make a few final requests First, if you're listening on YouTube, make sure to check out the rest of the channel. Lots of other videos other than these podcasts, uh, live trades, uh, a bunch of quick tip videos. So check out the channel and hopefully you ultimately decide to subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, then please subscribe and uh, ideally leave us a, a rating. Ratings really do help us. It doesn't take that much time, uh, but it really helps us out and goes a long way. And then finally, if you're listening at claytrader.com, Hit that share button, leave us a comment. 
I will read those and interact. So that's a great way to uh, you know interact with us uh, as a site. So again, I will see you back for part number two, which will be episode 121. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com. 